This is part two of a series of instructional videos on how to play Origins, colon, how we became human. Uh, last time I, we focused a lot on uh, cube juggling, innovation actions, um, the goal of the game, moving through the eras and everything. I, there might be a little bit more to go over on that. I think I pretty much covered it though. Um, catastrophes, and I don't know what else. You can watch the last one if you want to know what happened. Um, this time we're gonna we're gonna look more into population actions, movement on the board, the, the more of the map map part of things. And I think we'll um, take another look at the idea cards. I think we pretty much covered the public cards last time, so we'll look at the idea cards and um, just give you a little bit more detail on that. And then hopefully we'll have all the rules covered by the end of this video. And then I'll I'll make another video that shows an example of play. So you can kind of see how all the different parts we talked about fit together. All right. All right. So let's talk about the trade population action right here. How trading works is if, uh, if it's Green's turn and he wants to trade with his neighbor, Blue, can decide to make a trade. Now, Blue agrees to this because it's in Blue's advantage. And they pick an infrastructure track to compare. Now, in this case, they're going to pick the footprint infrastructure track. Uh, first thing Green has to ask herself is whether or not she has enough metropolises to uh, support another elder. She has three elders already, right? So she would need at least three metropolises. Um, metropolises, I think, is actually the word uh, to support another elder because you can gain one more elder than you have metropolises. Uh, she has three, so she's allowed to gain another one. Elder gain right there. That's what she gets out of the trade. Now what Blue's going to get is Blue gets to move one space over on the track. So how do you move around the board? The main way you're going to move around the board is through the population action migration and the population action population increase. Okay, so how migration works is um, if you want to migrate, you can move five spaces and per migration, so one, two, three, four, five. And we're just, I'm not even gonna look to see if those are legal moves given the current climate. Um, that's something I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but you just move point to point, pretty simple. Um, now what, what happens if you land on someone? So you go one, two, three, four, five, and you land on blue, that's gonna cause an attack, all right? Um, and how an attack works is you basically compare your, where you are in the metallurgy infrastructure track, um, and whoever has whoever's furthest up wins. If they're equal, they both die. All right. Uh, one caveat to that is if someone crosses water and then attacks, they get they're considered to be one less. So in the case of green and blue, even though they're both at zero, if green had crossed some water somehow because further up on the maritime track and landed on blue, green would, would still lose if they are equal. Population increase works thusly. You take uh, one of your guys off your population track, one of your cubes, um, and you can start it on one of your cubes. You can't keep it there, however. You can't stack cubes unless you're making an attack. Um, and then you move five. Two, three, four, five, up to five. You don't have to move a total of five. Um, so basically, you get a free migration action if you do a population increase. How terrain affects movement, movement is changed by two different things. Where you are in the infrastructure track, um, various infrastructure tracks really, and what the climate is like. So, um, important thing to understand when understanding how terrain affects you is what they what the game means by habitable and what the game means by enterable. All right, so enterable means you can go through it. So let's get a cube out here. Say this black cube is wandering around. If green is enterable, black can go through it. Okay. Now green can be enterable but not habitable. And habitable means you stop in it. All right. So if green is enterable but not habitable, black can go through it. Sure, but it can't stop there. Now, if green is habitable, black can stop there. There's never a case where something is habitable but not enterable, I don't believe. But maybe. I just So yellow spots are considered savanna when um, the Dansgard Oshker uh, card is on its colored side. Uh, you can go right through it. Nothing is preventing you from, from living there, from walking there. 
at all until it flips and it becomes desert. Now desert, you can't inhabit or enter except at certain spots on the infrastructure track. So once you get to here, your footprint gets here, you can move over the desert spots. Can't stop there yet though. Um, unless, let's see, where is it? You gotta have wells, wells right here. Energy infrastructure wells, you can live in them. Um, again, it, it's, it doubles the cost of movement over a desert spot when you have the caravan. Green spots are toggled by the greenhouse card, funnily enough. Um, when they're in parkland phase, you can, uh, parkland mode, you can totally live in them and inhabit them. If uh, they turn into jungle, however, they're not habitable, and you can't go through them unless you have um, some bronze tools, like machetes, perhaps, to cut through the jungle. Um, you, can live in, you can live in the jungle climate once you get pesticides here. Um, I guess you can kill the jungle off and then live there, but I, it seems like a lot of work just to just to live in the jungle. If at any time you're uh, if you're living in a if you're inhabiting a particular uh, color, and the climate changes to the a, play, uh, a climate that makes it uninhabitable, you suffer a loss. So in the case here, green and black would both sup, both lose these units, and so they'd go to their innovation track like so. Now we're going to talk about some white spots. This regular white spot here is always habitable and always enterable. So these, um, they're not ice or anything, you can get through them fine. These that are kind of like a half, a half and half, um, what, when it's, these are governed by the Milankovitch cycle. So when it's like this, um, on the colored side, it's ice and you can't go in there and you can't live there. Um, when it flips, however, it's tundra. And when it's tundra, I believe you have to have hay. So you have to have gotten sick enough to be here in the immunology infrastructure in order to live there or enter there. All right, the other thing um, that's affected by this is these, these land slash water spots. So when it's like this, these spots, uh, on the colored side, these spots are, are land. So you can, you can, land, you can ha inhabit them and enter them and all that stuff. Um, when it's the other side, it's as good as water. And water, you can't, you can't inhabit water. Unless, oh, you can inhabit water briefly if you're in this stage, but I think the only reason you would want to do that is in order to kind of leapfrog in a way. So say a green wanted to get across the water and they were here on the infrastructure track. They could go one, two, three, or five and stop right there. And then they could do the, um, Population boom, population increase, and jump one, two, three, four, five. Oh, something to note about migration is you can only move each cube once per turn. The other thing affected by the Milankovitch cycle is these white bridges. Um, when it's in the icy side, the colored side, you can cross. When it's the other side, you can't cross unless you have rafts. The red bridges here, uh, you can only cross with the rafts, which is... First, first thing on the track there. Let's talk about some peculiarities. All right, say green is here and wants to move there. All right, it goes one, two. Now green has to ask blue if blue will let green pass. If blue says yes, green can continue to go there and that's all well and good. Um, if blue says no, however, an attack happens and we compare where we are on the metallurgy chart. Uh, now say it's like this right here. Um, green is further than blue, so green is going to win. Blue goes away. All right, now what has happened is blue has lost its last unit on the map. All right, right there. So we are in a condition known as slavery. Now, slavery doesn't have to just happen if one person has gotten rid of someone's last unit. Anytime someone doesn't have any sort of map presence at all, they automatically go into slavery. Now, what happens if... Um, they go into slavery due to climate change or due to something that's not another player attacking them is the player who is now enslaved chooses who their cruel master is to be. All right, first thing you're going to do when someone enslaves someone else, and in this case, remember, green has enslaved blue, is you're going to compare where they are on this, uh, this footprint track. All right, green is further along, so blue gets this wonderful bonus and gets to move up there. And then you put green on top of blue to show that 
green is blue is cool, cruel master. Now, if the reverse were true, right, and again, green is the the enslaver and blue is the slave, right? Green, green still gets to move up there and becomes a slave. So basically, their footprints become equal. They go to the higher one, and then the slaver, the, the enslaver, goes on top. And other things, um, slaves can't move on the map if they go on the map. Um, they can go on the map, however. How they do it is they do it with the standard population increase action, and they can go to a, to a spot outside of a metropolis and sit there. That is what they can do. There are several other things they can't do along with move. They can't, um, I'm just going to read the list. You can look at this in the rule book. They can't domesticate. They can't do the revolution action. They can't trade. They can't perform naturalist, which is a domestication action. Um, they also can't urbanize, which is to create a city, and they can't do Sabine raids. They can, however, Sabine raid, I didn't go over that. I'll go over that after I talk about slavery. Um, they can, however, attack other people who aren't, um, who aren't slaves or who aren't their, their master. So I guess how that would work is if white was outside Green's metropolis here, blue could come in and do a population increase and perform an attack like so. So the slaver and the enslaved have this uh, symbiotic relationship now that they're um, they're kind of joined, uh, and basically how that works is if one of them gets an advance, say through a card play, and I'll just keep flipping cards till I find one that has an advance here. Yeah, they're not very common. Okay, here we go. So we have this maritime card. Say green played this or blue, it doesn't matter. Um, say green played it and we have a situation like that, right? Green gets to move forward and blue also gets to move forward one, right? If the reverse were true and blue played this card, blue would move forward and green would move forward. Pretty nice. And that's the main thing that green could get out of um, enslaving blue other than this. Uh, acculturation is acculturation of blue is easier for green to do in this slavery situation. So, say we have a situation where green has uh, a public card with two blue two stars there, and blue also has a public card with two stars. Normally, green would not be able to culture that is steal, I guess, worker from blue. However, since they're enslaved, green can do it on a tie. Seems like a small thing, but it could come up. So considering that blue and green aren't allowed to attack each other while they're in, in this um, slaver and, and slave relationship, how does slavery end? Well, there are three main ways. First way is if green goes into chaos, uh, blue is immediately free. Another way is if green, and green herself is enslaved, blue is immediately free. And the final way is if one of them makes a barbarian raid on the other. Now, they're not allowed to attack, but they can do barbarian raids. I didn't talk about this part of the card, but that's this symbol here. I'll talk about barbarian raids later. Um, then the slave relationship ends. So when the slave relationship ends, Blue, the, the slave, gets all its guest workers back, even from players who aren't the, the, the enslaver. So Blue got one back from White, Blue one got, got one back from Green. Anyone who has an elder of Blue's gives it back. Um, another thing that happens is all of Blue's uh, cubes that are around a green metropolis, which is likely where they're going to be, um, immediately start sieging that metropolis. So I'll go over sieges later. Um, and then finally, if Blue got free due to green going into chaos, whatever cubes that green lost due to the chaos get replaced with green with blue cubes from blue's population track which could then in turn cause blue to go into chaos final little attacky thing to talk about is sabine raid um, if you've attacked someone during your turn you can use as an, a, a population action a sabine raid which lets you ransack and we talked about ransack last time that's when you take a card from their discard pile uh, that's a nice population action I find because it's one of the few ways you can actually draw cards as a population action. So if your innovation is all stuffed up, um, it's it's a way you can you can get more cards into your hand. 
All right, sieges are rather simple. Uh, how a siege works is if you have migratory units outside someone's metropolis and you besiege them, um, you compare strength and whoever has the highest strength wins. Now strength is determined in the following way. The, the sieger has strength equal to the number of migratory units they have in the hex in question, which is this hex right here with the siva there. Um, the besieged, the defender, has a strength equal to their footprint plus the number of migratory units in the hex. So right now, they're going to be tied because blue has three and green has a footprint of three. All right, now if green had this guy right here, green would win because green has three plus one, one migratory unit, that's four, which is greater than three. Now, one little tricky thing is if one person has is higher on the metallurgy chart, doesn't matter how much higher, could be like this, they, they get an additional one. So here again, they're tied. In this case, blue wins, because blue would have four, and green would have three. Now if the besieger wins, they get to take a guest worker, like so, and they get the, they get the metropolis for themselves. All right. um, now if they don't win, and they have to win, so if they tie, nothing happens. If they lose, nothing happens. All right, starvation is also very simple. It, it relies solely on your footprint. So if it's your turn and it comes time to resolve starvation, you count the number of squares, cubes, in the hex. And that could also be city, city cubes, at any kind of cube. We'll put one there just to, just to make it clear. All right, so here we have five. One, two, three, four, five. All right, and if that's greater than your footprint, blue has a footprint of three, so it is, you have to take off a number of units so that it's down to the number of your footprint. So here we have five, you have to take off two, and they have to be your own. You can't, you can't starve out other people. All right, I think we'll finish up here. I think I've covered everything, um, except for a revisit to the idea cards here. Um, so let's take a look at, I got one that was very busy with icons and one from Arrow 1 because there's, there's one thing I wanted to point out from, from that. I guess I'll point that out first. All the icons on here are optional except for two sorts of icons. The first sort is encephalizations. That's the ones that remove the cubes from your brain map card. All right, so here we have this encephalization. If black played this card, black would have to clear up his acorn space. All right, the other one that is you have to do is elder losses. So if you played this side of the card, you would have to lose an elder like so. All right, let's, let's just briefly go over the other icons on here and I'll explain the two new ones. Um, so this is the requirement to play the card. You have to have a footprint of two and a metallurgy of two to play this side of the card. You can always play this side of the card. Um, this is the effect of the left side of the card. It moves your metallurgy up one to a limit of three. So if your metallurgy is at three, you're not going to move at all. If it's at four, you're not going to move at all. If you're going to move, if you're at two, you're going to move one. If you're at one, you're going to move one. All right. Um, this allows you to domesticate an animal with a minus one to your roll. So you have to obviously be in a space with an animal. So here you would get a minus two to your roll because. It it's already has a minus. And then you compare the roll to this chart. All right, and just do what it says. Right, so then if you play the right hand side, you have to lose an elder. You get to do a fecundity decrease, which is great. Moves down there. Um, then you also get to do a barbarian raid. Now how a barbarian raid works, is you choose one of your neighbors. So remember, that's going to be someone in the same hex or a hex away, right? Um, and they either have to lose one of their public cards or an elder. All right, if they lose a public card, it's taken out of the game. And any time a barbarian raid card is played, it's also taken out of the game. All right, so here we have this other icon, cultural diffusion is what this means. And this applies to both sides, though in this case with the barbarian raid arm there. If you play this side of the card, the cultural diffusion won't work because it involves the discard pile. So 
when you you have a card with this eye uh, uh, face up on it as your top card in your discard pile, um, you can ignore arrows when you ransack. Okay, so if your arrow one, which this isn't an arrow one card, but if your arrow one and you have this face up, you can ransack arrow two cards, you can ransack arrow three cards, any arrow of card you like. Um, as long as that card remains there. Another thing you get to do is if someone attacks you, you get to do a free ransack on them. Alrighty, I think that covers it. Um, feel free to leave a comment if I got something wrong or if something was unclear and I will uh, try to, to clear it up for you. Um, it didn't feel as long as the last one, so hopefully this wasn't 40 minutes. And hopefully, hopefully we're, I don't think it's probably under an hour, but hopefully it's not so long as that it's not useful to you. Um, I hope it helps facilitate gameplay. I am still going to make make the fun video, as I think of it in my heart, uh, where I get to play the game um, and show you how that's done. It's been a while since I've played uh, straight up Origins, so that's great.